All right, hi there, grade 10s. Okay, so at this point in the unit, we are moving into our second portion. So we have already covered kinematics, and now we're doing dynamics. Now it's the same notebooklet, same PowerPoint. However, it does have a different workbook. So make sure you check Edsby for the part two dynamics workbook when it comes time. All right, I'm going to be doing a bit of a longer lesson today on forces and Newton's laws, but I'm going to be breaking this up into two videos just for uh, time's sake in terms of how much storage I have. All right, so in this lesson, we're gonna have to be able to describe what force is and how it's related to motion and describe Newton's three laws. This last portion here we are omitting, so uh, we're not gonna be doing inertia and car collisions. Okay, I'm sure you've heard of Newton's laws, but maybe you didn't know kind of where they came from. So Newton's laws relate to a person, Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, he lived between 1642 and 1727, so a long time ago, but his uh, knowledge and science is still prevalent and still kind of uh, relevant in today's understanding. So he is responsible and credited for developing three laws of motion involving forces. So the unit for force was actually named after him. So the unit for force is a Newton and its symbol is an N. So what are forces? So forces are vectors. And as we know, whoops, forces are vectors. So if you think back to scalars and vectors, this means that the magnitude or the amount and the direction are important. So if you have a two forces working in opposite directions, they can in fact balance each other out because their, their direction matters. Now, the definition of a force is basically any push or pull on an object, right? I'm sure we've used this in our day-to-day -day life. If you're pushing an object, you are applying a force. Same thing if you're pulling an object. Now, that push or pull or that force can create movement in that object. So we've also talked about acceleration. And acceleration is about an object changing speed. Now, what we know is that in order for objects to, in fact, accelerate, there has to be an overall force acting on that object. Okay, objects don't accelerate on their own. There has to be an overall acting force. This could also apply to deceleration. Now, when we're talking about forces and because they are vectors, we can consider the net or overall force on that object in order to figure out how it's going to affect the motion. So if we look at this picture here, all right, the guy at the back is pushing with a force of 90 newtons, and the guy at the front is pulling with a force of 70 newtons. If we add these forces up together, there's a total force of 160 newtons to the left. Now what isn't accounted for here is there's likely an opposing force of friction. I'll just make up a number here. Let's say that opposing force was 40 newtons. And because that would be in the opposite direction, I could account for that by adding a negative 40 newtons. So really, my overall acting force would be still 120 newtons, and it would still power over to the left. All right, so that's simply how you calculate kind of overall force if you're given forces, is you do that vector addition, accounting for opposing directions with positives and negatives. All right. Now, when we're drawing vector diagrams, we're not going to do a lot of these, but you can show forces with a vector arrow, which is simply a line that typically connects to a dot and the arrow points in the direction. Now, the important thing when you're drawing vector diagrams with forces is that the arrow length needs to uh, kind of account to the amount of force, all right, and then the arrow points in the direction. So we have to account for the size of the force and the direction. So if I was drawing two forces and one was, let's say, 10 newtons to the right and the other one was 5 newtons to the right, my arrows would have to show that, right? So my second one would be half as long as the first one, approximately. So let's do a couple quick examples here. Bill and Bob are both pulling on a tug-of-war rope with a force of 10 newtons in opposite directions. Draw the diagram. 
All right. So you typically draw the vector diagram where the arrows actually move away from the object. And this is a scientific diagram, so it's not actually drawing a picture. So all I would do is I would show kind of that, whoops, sorry. You typically just show the object perhaps as a box, something simple. And then I have my two arrows moving away from the box. Okay, that box is simply representing kind of the center point of the rope. Now in theory, both of my arrows should be the same size. They are representing an equivalent force. Because my forces are equal, will the rope move? No. Okay, you can also do a quick calculation here. My net force would be equal to 10 newtons plus a negative 10 newtons to again account for that opposite direction, which would equal zero. If your net force is zero newtons, that can mean one of two things. That is either going to move mean that there is no motion happening, or that would mean if the object was already moving, that it would stay in motion at its same speed. Okay, next, Bill is pushing with 10 newtons to the right, and Bob is pushing with 5 newtons to the left. Draw the diagram, will the box move? So again, the only difference here is my length of arrows have changed. So Bill is pushing, even though Bill is pushing, his arrow still actually moves away from the object. And Bob is pushing with five newtons to the left. All right, now I can see visually that the object is going to the box. Box will move to the right. All right, and I could also do this with a quick calculation. So F net, force net, is equal to, now we know according to our conventions that right is typically indicated as positive and left is typically indicated as negative. So I'm doing vector addition, 10 newtons plus negative five still is five newtons and it's positive. And that positive indicates to the right. Okay, a little bit more on force here. We are talking about the units here. Force is measured in newtons according to Sir Isaac Newton. Symbol is N. But again, this unit doesn't actually really tell us anything because it was created after a person. But what a Newton actually is equivalent to is a kilogram meter per second squared. Now, hopefully those units are familiar to you. Kilogram is the unit we use for mass and meters per second squared is the units for acceleration. So that should kind of indicate to you how we calculate force but we'll get that in a minute. So when it comes time to do some calculations, it's very important. Because a newton equals a kilogram meter per second squared, mass has to be in excel er, sorry, mass has to be in kilograms and acceleration has to be in meters per second squared. So that means that you may have to convert units. So if you had grams and you had to convert that to kilograms, you're going to have to go all the way back to kind of the start of our unit. And there are a thousand grams in one kilogram, which means if you have to go from grams to kilograms, you need to divide by 1,000. Oops, it doesn't look like a thousand. All right, so keep that in mind. Think about that metric staircase. All right, now that gets us a bit more into understanding Newton's laws. Okay, so, so far in physics, we were talking about kinematics, which is kind of dealing with speed and acceleration. Now we're going to talk about why things move with Newton's laws, which is dynamics. So Newton's first law is stated as um, an object at rest remains at rest, and an object in motion remains in motion unless acted on by an unbalanced force. All right, so pretty straightforward here. If an object is not moving, Newton's first law states that it's not going to spontaneously move, right? We need, an, we need a force to get things moving. If it's already in motion, it's going to continue in motion 
unless a force acts on it. Okay, so we use this law to explain, you know, a lot of phenomena, but we have to remember that we have, there are forces like friction and things like that that act on our world to slow things down. But without that, if you were to kick a soccer ball and there was no such thing as the kind of gravity or friction, if you were to kick a soccer ball, it would continue moving at that same speed, essentially indefinitely. But because we have friction, it acts as an unbalanced force to help slow that down. All right, so this is kind of example here. In space, there are very almost negligible forces of friction. So space probes, they're actually able to kind of continue moving at a constant speed after their initial propulsion, okay? Because an object in motion remains in motion unless acted on by an outside force, okay? All right, now Newton's first law is largely due to something called inertia. All objects that have mass have inertia. What inertia is, is the tendency, you should know this definition, the tendency of an object to resist a change in motion. Okay, the tendency of an object to resist a change in motion, which means objects want to keep doing whatever they're doing. They want to stay in motion if they are in motion, or they want to stay at rest if they are in rest. And this all has to do with the object's mass. Okay, an object that has more mass has more inertia, which is why it is harder to move if it is still, or it is harder to stop moving if it is already moving. Okay, think about these two buckets here. One is empty and one is full of sand. They're the same size, but what's going to be different is their mass. If you tried to push both of these buckets with the same amount of force, obviously the bucket with sand which has more mass, is going to be harder to push because of inertia, okay? If these buckets were both moving already, which bucket would be harder to stop? Again, the bucket with more mass, okay? Because it has more mass, which means it has more inertia, which means it is harder to get it to change its already existing motion, all right? Object at rest remains at rest and an object in motion wants to remain in motion unless acted on by an outside force. That's Newton's first law. So just take a look at this picture. What's happening here? Okay, this was a big mistake. What we can see is a lesson in inertia and Newton's first law. The truck was likely moving, traveling at a constant speed, when the truck hit its brakes, the stone continued moving. So an object in motion stays in motion unless acted on by an outside force. That stone continued in motion even though the truck had stopped, which kind of forced it to plow through. So the truck had brakes, but the stone did not. And an object in motion stays in motion unless acted on by an outside force. And because that stone has a lot of mass, it is harder to stop. There you have it. A couple more examples of inertia. Inertia in Newton's first law is seen a lot with vehicle crashes. And it's kind of the reason seatbelts are really important. So let's look at this picture. Okay, a vehicle crashes into a rigid barrier and stops almost immediately because of the applied force from the barrier. So car hits barrier. That barrier was the force in the car that caused it to stop. The passengers in the car are not wearing seatbelts. So there is nothing to stop their motion. So the passenger was in motion with the vehicle. The vehicle stopped due to the unbalanced force, but the passengers have nothing to stop their motion. So they will keep moving until acted on by an outside force, which if they're not wearing seatbelts and there's no airbags to stop them, just might be the windshield. So if your car stops, the reason you keep flying forward is due to Newton's first law. Okay, an object in motion stays in motion until acted on by an outside force. All right, another example here. Newton's laws can be used in sports. So in football, there are some circumstances in which a team is trying to move the ball only a few yards into the end zone to score a touchdown. One strategy is to hand the ball to a player who is not necessarily fast and agile, but who has a large mass. So maybe you've seen this. Uh, I'm not a huge football star fan 
whatever expert, but I've seen this where kind of right at the end where they're trying to score a touchdown, they won't give the ball to their typical skinny runners. They'll pass the ball to their big guys and they just try and jump over the end line. Now, the physics behind this is that those large players have large mass, which means they have large inertia, which means once those big guys get going, they're going to be harder to stop. So that's kind of the idea there. Hopefully, they're going to have a lot of inertia kind of moving forwards and they're going to be harder to stop. So they'll likely get over that end line. Another example. A vehicle is sitting at rest at a stoplight when all of a sudden it gets struck from behind. Describe the motion of the passenger's body the instant after the collision. What safety features do vehicles have to protect this? So in this scenario, the vehicle is not moving. If the vehicle were to be hit from the behind, the vehicle will be pushed forward. But again, the passenger is a separate entity. So the passenger will stay at rest and the vehicle will be jolted forward. And what hopefully protects us, this is kind of resulting in whiplash, but hopefully our headrest will protect us. So depending on the, if you're kind of already in motion and you get in an accident, you will fly forward. But if you're already in rest and the car moves forward, your head whips back. So there's kind of a few ways that cars can be damaging and uh, Newton's Laws explains the motion. It's also similar to being on a bus. If you've ever tried to stand on a bus and the bus kind of stops and starts, your body moves kind of independently of the vehicle. Okay, I'm gonna stop here and then I'm gonna start the second video on Newton's Laws but just so I can save my videos. All right. Take